everyone and welcome aboard the flight of the Sankofa this morning which lands in a small country that saw the birth of one of the most ardent African nationalists and whose destiny is intimately related to the two world wars. This country's march tower independence was symbolized by the opposition of two politicians, Silvanus Olympio and Nicolas Grunitsky, a battle of titans with very uncertain prospect after independence. You may have guessed that I'm taking you today into the mazes of an abrasive history of Togo, this German colony that gained independence from France on April 27, 1960. African History Daily by my daddy. Between the 17th and 18th century, the coastal strip between the Ashanti Kingdom in present-day Ghana and that of Dahomey in present Benin was a free space which was already visited by the Portuguese, the Danish and the Dutch who had established trading and ports there. Later, a German explorer, Gustav Nachtigal, signed a protectorate agreement in 1884 with a local chief, King Mlapa III, who controlled a territory around Lake Togo. On the basis of this protectorate, Germany, which wanted to be present on this coast, established its authority on the interior of the country by baptizing it Togoland. Germany installed its own traders and reduced the influence of the French and the English. The authority of Germany on this territory is made official by the Berlin Conference in 1885. This actually made Togoland one of the scenes of fierce fighting between Europeans on African soil when the First World War began in 1914. After fighting against France and England, Germany was defeated as of August 1914. Having lost the war, Germany had to abandon its colonial power status and the four colonies it owned before the First World War. The colonies were then redistributed among the other colonial powers by the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations, under a special status called Management Mandate. The division of Togo between France, which received two-thirds of it, and the United Kingdom resulted in a two-headed country with its two parts known respectively as the French Togo and British Togo. This situation turned Togo automatically into a distant war front when began in 1939 the Second World War, when France, which was then occupied by Germany and signed the occupation agreement in 1940, the direct consequence for Togo is that the border between the two zones of French and British influence got closed, complicating even more the life of local populations. Germany finally lost the war again, and this time, the United Nations, which succeeded to the League of Nations, took the lead and confirmed the placing of Togo under French and British trusteeship in 1948. French Togo then joined the group of the other West African French colonies, despite its special status, forming a single constituency with Dahomey, the present Benin, and both were represented by a single parliament member, but without moving tower unification local political life started taking place. Silvanus Olympio, a supporter of a reunited Togo, created the Togolese Unity Committee, opposing Nikola Grunitsky and his Togolese popular movement, the MPT, who was campaigning for a closer association with France. For the British, it seems obvious to join the strip of land they inherited since the end of the First World War to the Gold Coast to make it in a single country, the current Ghana. But the French wanted a direct connection of the French Togo to France. So they organized the first referendum and then the second one in 1958 under the control of the UN. That referendum was won by Olympio's party confirming a separate development of French-speaking Togo. Then Sylvanus Olympio became Prime Minister. His plan was to form a reunified state by recovering the part of Togo that was attached to Ghana. He also declined the offer of the Pan-Africanist president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, to merge the two countries into one. On April 7, 1960, Olympio finally succeeded in obtaining Togo's independence and two days later, he was elected as the first president of the Republic by beating his longtime opponent, still supported by France, Nicolas Grunitsky. However, on January 13, 1963, so three years after his election, 
the president Sylvanus Olympio was assassinated by the militaries. So when the Togolese people woke up on that morning, they found an empty president seat. They were horrified and frightened by such a crazy and totally irresponsible action by the militaries. Many saw in this killing the hand of the French imperialism that wanted to get rid of a president who was fighting for a total freedom from France, including his own national currency. But we may never know why and who has loosely decided the murder of President Sylvanus Olympio, the first African president murdered by his own people during his exercise of power after having freed his country from colonizers. My African cliché of the day is a belief which in most African culture promises a curse to anyone who gets their hand on the father of a mother. I do not even dare to think of what is promised to whoever goes to kill his father. By killing the father of its independence, has Togo committed an unforgivable sin? Unforgivable to the point of having attracted on the country such a curse, so much atrocious suffering and so many deaths by hundreds for more than 50 years now. Well, it's up to you to judge that, to pray for all the victims of Togolese politics for more than five decades, to burn candles for a country with a troubled history, to your own cliches about violence in African politics, to our African continent, and I look forward to seeing you next week on a forever non-violent Sankofa bird. Thank you and have a good weekend.